Um, hi, everyone. I'm Keith Cole, and welcome to our webinar today um, titled Secure Data and Delivered Seamlessly, hosted by both Mentis and Windocs. Um, today, our agenda uh, is I'll introduce the speakers. We're going to talk about the problem of the need for data, the need for security, and then talk about the Windocs Mentis solution, and then we'll end with a demo. A couple things. Um, this is being recorded. If you have any questions during the um, during the presentation or the demo, feel free to put them in the chat window and uh, we'll keep this relatively informal. We'll, we'll interrupt with questions. We won't necessarily need to keep them to the end. Um, so our speakers today uh, uh, is Paul, who's the founder and vice president of product management at Windocs, and then Rajesh, who's also the founder and CEO of Mentis. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Paul uh, to talk to Talk, take over our first uh, topic, the need for data. Yeah, thank you, Keith. Uh, let's have the next slide. It uh, should be no surprise to uh, the audience that uh, one of the big challenges that we've had in the past uh, decade is simply the proliferation of uh, uh, data platforms. Uh, we've gone from uh, enterprise data being primarily relational to having a broad mix of uh, data types today, a relational, uh, NoSQL, uh, graph type, document type, key value stores, and more. Uh, it's further complicated now with a, a growing range of uh, cloud-based uh, data services and options uh, that are not always uh, compatible with on-premise operations. And so the world that we live in today is far more complex than uh, what we experienced uh, even just a few years ago. And uh, next slide, please. And that is further uh, exacerbated by the fact that we have ever more increasing uh, diversity of applications for the data uh, as well, uh, where we have always had development and test needs. Now we have continuous integration pipelines that expect uh, application environments to be delivered on demand in an automated fashion. We have machine learning and analytics uh, needs as well. And so uh, CIOs, DBAs, and DevOps teams face this need for more fast uh, delivery of data environments. I was having a conversation with a CIO just yesterday who really captured the uh, problem uh, in his description. He said, look, you know, in their case, they had hundreds of lower level database environments, uh, a broad mix of uh, virtual machines and workstations. And uh, he described it in terms of a sprawl of VMs and storage. Uh, he shared that they have very poor visibility in management on these environments. They, they know that many of these environments have very low utilization, uh, some aren't being utilized at all. Uh, they also represent a growing uh, security concern uh, for the lack of the ability to enforce uh, data privacy policies in these environments. At the same time, uh, the business faces a nonstop growing demand for more and more environments uh, for all the reasons that we've just discussed, uh, particularly uh, for you know, DevOps oriented processes, uh, you know, there's just tickets nonstop. So, and the problem that they face today is that they uh, take hours or even days to provision these environments. So their service levels to the business are poor and needs to improve. And he knows that the uh, default option by his own infrastructure and ops teams is to buy more storage. Uh, storage from uh, Cohesity or Actifio or other platforms can give him more data agility, but at a certain level of expense. And then he also recognizes these storage platforms create dependencies uh, for any DevOps type operations going forward, uh, further complicating uh, their plans to move between on-premise operations and various public clouds. Uh, next slide, yeah. And so what we've done is we've developed a, a versioned secure uh, data repository. 
uh, to give the ability to deliver writable database environments in seconds. Each on delivery will uh, consume, you know, 40 megabytes on delivery. Very importantly, it's a standards software-based solution that runs on standard Linux and Windows servers and leverages existing storage systems, be it on-premise or cloud. So no new infrastructure is needed to implement this. And it's a cloud native system that supports containers and Kubernetes, as well as conventional instances and workstations. So it can drop into any on-premise uh, environment and uh, meet these needs. Also, this is a, because it's a software-based solution that can be installed and up and running in a matter of minutes, this is easily managed and it's really designed to be managed by DevOps leads, developers, and DBAs. So it really unburdens the infrastructure staff from having to be involved in uh, the ongoing database delivery process. And the focus of this session is uh, not only to demo this solution, but also to, also to show how Mentis security is built in. Uh, security is built into this uh, workflow with user and group level access controls, audit logs, as well as all the goodness that Mentis brings in the way of data discovery, masking, tokenization, and other good uh, goodness. So the end result is a fully secure environment uh, being delivered. Now, when you contrast what's possible here in the upper right versus what's uh, typical today in the lower left, uh, you can see that we're addressing the business need for speed and volume in a diverse data environment with self-service and CI delivery of data environments in seconds. And interestingly, when the solution is uh, focused on the use of containers and uh, containers among our customers are incredibly popular. Uh, most people have not experienced the goodness of databases with Docker containers, but containers combined with this data virtualization allows people to actually cut their lower level infrastructure costs in half or more. Uh, if you can picture the, uh, a 90% reduction in the number of VMs being used, you can get a, a sense for what's possible. Um, Paul, why is, why and, is that important? And how, how does it cut, um, how do you save money? Well, it's a good question, Keith. The Docker containers, you get density, you know, so a single VM can support 50 or even 100 simultaneous database environments. So the business benefits by having far fewer VMs for this lower level database uh, management, that drives uh, significant savings, not only in infrastructure, but also in the uh, maintenance and support of the infrastructure. Uh, so it's primarily driven by the reduction in VMs, but also the database virtualization will cut storage costs by a factor of 90 to 95%. Those two things together drive a significant savings in uh, not only the storage infrastructure, but the support and maintenance of it. Um, now, in contrast, the current situation is taking hours or days to restore backups to these fixed instances. There's a significant problem of VM and storage sprawl. There's a lack of a path forward for containers and Kubernetes support and data security is an open question. Okay, and that's, uh, that's my framing of the uh, problem that we face today. So thank you, Paul. So let me talk about the need for security. Um, as much as organizations are now moving into the need for provisioning production data into non-production, and they need it fast, they need it uh, rapidly, they need it to be agile, security is not something that we can forget. Gone are the days when you can have sprawl of your production data systems and copies of that data in multiple non-production systems without that data being masked. Um, it used to be a nice to have uh, several years ago, but now it is being, being, becoming more and more necessary and mandatory for you to do this. Um, on the next slide, we will see that, um, next slide, please. Geographically, right, throughout the world, um, people are waking up to the fact that organizations are collecting and storing more and more sensitive data 
So geographies or uh, countries are creating regulations around protecting sensitive data. So therefore, you need the data in your production for doing your business. But every time you make a copy for development or testing purposes, Paul and Windows can deliver that data to you rapidly. But that, that also means that you now have to protect that data. It is simple, uh, necessary information. It's not nice to have anymore. You have to do it. Look at the countries that have regulations already, um, all the way from GDPR um, in most of Europe. You have PDPA in uh, Singapore. You have LGPD in Brazil. You've got more and more regulations. There is PIPEDA in Canada. There is POPI in South Africa. India is uh, looking at a regulation called the IDPL or PDPA. Um, and other Asian nations also have similar regulations. So this is becoming more and more global, the need for data security. So every time you make a copy of production data, you, you are going to have to mask it. So that is the look at uh, the globe overall. But then if you look at just the United States, which is where most of the, our attendees today are from, 49 states have some form of breach notification law, which started all the way back in California and uh, Senate Bill 1386, almost 15 years ago now, um, and other states have also passed it. Now, subsequently, uh, even after this slide was published, Colorado has passed a regulation. Uh, Connecticut just tried to pass a regulation last week, which was uh, which failed uh, in the Senate, but they will present it again, uh, I'm sure, in the next session. So you're going to see a GDPR type regulation all over the United States. California, again, led the charge with the CCPA. Other states are passing. Colorado has now passed. Connecticut is attempting it. Before long, you will see that more and more states pass some regulation like that. But that is just a, a broad horizontal privacy regulation. But then on the right, you see, if you are in healthcare, you have to comply with HIPAA. I think that is um, well known. FERPA is for family education rights. So if you're a university or if you're a higher ed or if you're a K through 12 um, institution, you have to comply with FERPA. There's something called COPPA for ch children's hospitals, protecting children's online privacy act. COPPA is available. Gramlage Bliley is something for banking and financial services institutions. If you accept credit cards, PCI DSS compliance is also mandatory. Um, and the most interesting thing is, if you are a university in the United States, you likely will have to comply with all of these acts of legislation because universities accept credit cards, universities provide loans, universities also provide, have family information, and some of them also provide healthcare uh, coverage for their students. So depending on the type of industry you're in, depending on the geography you're in, you're facing multiple regulations to comply with. And that is even before the United States passes a federal regulation. There have been many introduced bills across the US. Um, none of them have passed so far, but it's only um, a matter of time before the United States passes a federal regulation for data privacy, similar to GDPR. But knowing how these types of regulations work, when the US passes a federal regulation, it'll be a leap forward. It'll, be, it'll go much farther than what GDPR intended. If you remember all the way to Sarbanes-Oxley, that was game changing. Similarly, this federal regulation that is going to come out is going to be game changing. So you would look, watch out for that. So on the next slide, but privacy regulation is one thing, right? Like why are these regulations becoming important? Uh, there are many studies um, where we talk about what is the cost of a data breach? So the Ponemon Institute uh, does an annual study and an average data breach is 3.86 million, right? So as long as you keep uh, sensitive data in your databases and your file servers, um, you have to protect this data. And if, it is, if you don't protect it, if there was an incident, it'll cost you about 3.86 million per breach. And this is increasing. In 2021, we've already surpassed the number of um, Records lost in all of 2020 and 2020 again was a high water mark. So every year the number of records breach keeps going up and, uh, and it's becoming important for organizations to mandate, mandatorily protect that data. So imagine the scenario that um, Paul talked about where there is a diversity of data sources, there is uh, enterprise wide data on different production locations and the need for creating these non-production data databases, especially in this continuous integration world where data is required very rapidly, creating these data sources rapidly creates a problem for you where you have to also secure that data. So this is really the reason why you, not, you need to start thinking about not only delivering the data quickly, 
you also have to think about delivering it securely, which is the topic of our conversation is why do you need to secure this data? Why do you need to deliver it quickly? And why do you need to secure it before you deliver it? So these are some of the conversations that I wanted to talk about. Um, so now we can go on to our next topic where we'll talk about um, what Mentis and um, Windows will do together. Um, let me just talk about what Mentis can do with the security, and then I'll hand it over back to um, Paul to talk about what Windows does. First thing Mentis does is it provides a sensitive data discovery solution. So before you start delivering data very rapidly through Windows, Mentis will discover all of the data and create a catalog of where your sensitive data is. There are about 70 plus data classifications to help you find data that matters for GDPR or CCPA or HIPAA. And our data classifications actually go beyond what all of the global privacy regulations say. So as new regulations come in, you will already be protected for it. Uh, we are the highest ranked sensitive data discovery solution in Gartner Peer Insights, which is an anonymous customer feedback program that Gartner runs. Uh, our discovery is rated at 4.8 out of 5. It's the highest ranked software in, in their history. So that is our discovery. So first we'll find that across all of your data sources across the entire enterprise, we'll document where your sensitive data is. Uh, and then on the next slide, we will, uh, here are some ways, right? Like in enterprise data is very complex. These data sources are very, very difficult, different. Um, and it is important for us to find the data accurately without um, false positives and without any true negatives. So we deploy these things called pathways, which are pre-built uh, intelligence on how to find sensitive data. If you're looking for something like a first name, we will deploy many mechanisms, including data analysis, dictionary analysis, to find a corroborative way of finding sensitive data. And when it goes to um, unstructured data, the natural language processing is important. We use some artificial intelligence to find sensitive data as well. So that is for names, which is not a structured format. But if I'm looking for something like national identifier, which in the US is a social security number, is a nine digit number, we use a slightly different approach. So here we do some pattern matching. And then on top of that, we do data analysis to help us accurately find all of the data, no matter what the data store is. Um, so before you start migrating and pulling data in rapid structures, we need to make sure that we know what the data we have, we are going to start moving from production down. So that's what our discovery does. It helps you identify all of the data. When that data is identified, then we go into the anonymization part of it. Uh, and the anonymization really is static data masking, where we change the data for the uses of um, all IT reasons, whether it is development or testing or analytics, whatever the reason, Mentis provides the right solution uh, in the data itself. For example, names are anonymized with other similarly constructed names. Social security numbers are also really good social security numbers, but they're not original. Addresses are anonymized, date of birth is anonymized, all of them in keeping with what the regulations are expecting, um, as well as not compromising a developer's ability to perform their activities or somebody that's performing um, analytics. They need to retain the baseline information, the demographic information, the core pieces of what is important for analytics. That needs to be retained without compromising security or compliance. So that's what Mentis does. And we are the highest ranked static data masking vendor also in Gartner Peer Insights. Um, and, um, and if you see on the right, we also are, were the customer's choice for data masking for 2020 and 2021. Um, and on the next slide. So here are some of the methods that we use, right? For names, we create similarly co constructed, well-constructed, gender aware names. So Andrew was changed to Harper. Clara has changed to Mercy, and we maintain the format. If you're using um, uppercase, we create uppercase names. If it's all lowercase, it's lowercase names. If it's mixed case, we follow that. Uh, and this is all driven by discovery. Our discovery tells us where the names are, and our static data masking actually changes the data in a repeatable and consistent format. That's an example of how we anonymize names. And then for national identifiers, we can use all the way from uh, something like AES-256 type format preserving encryption, or we can use some simple format preserving encryption to generate really good social security number values that are useful for IT purposes, but not for any form of data theft. So we, we use examples like this to create really good non-production data. Go ahead, next. So now let's talk about what Mentis and Windox does together. Paul, back to you. 
Actually, we got a couple questions. Sure. Um, so this might be um, talked about in the uh, in the demo. So the first question is, what are the secured authenticated mechanisms that are supported, including uh, SSO, single sign-on? So from the Mentis side, Paul, uh, we cover, uh, we work with all SSOs, um, LDAP onwards, OTA, whatever um, SSOs for our application. Um, and then once, as you see the Mentis Windows demo, you will see that Mentis becomes a subset of the overall Windows process. And we are quiet and seamless and we sit together within the overall process. Um, the next question, I right. think you answered this. Um, but how about data masking with distributed ar architectures, including databases? How can we make sure to correlate some data across databases? So great question. So first our discovery will document where the sensitive data is. So we find first names in multiple databases. All of them will be classified as first names. And the anonymization method is data driven. So if the data is Jack, it will be changed to John and that will happen consistently across the entire distributed architectures, whether it is in structured databases or um, in unstructured file formats, our anonymization routines are built in such a way that they keep that consistency. Social security number, same way. If it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, the original data, and we, let's say we change it to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, we will change it consistently in all locations where that data is present. So it is data driven. The data first informs the data classification and then the data classification and the data informs the data masking so we can maintain that consistency across your entire estate. I hope that answered your question. Great, thanks for Josh. Okay. Next slide. Yes. So we wanted to talk about data set cops. This is a topic that uh, Paul and I spent a lot of time talking about uh, we were looking at DevOps, uh, which is what um, Windows is very good at, and then Mendis provides the security aspect of it. But really, in this example of what we're talking about in provisioning data, the better fit is data SecOps. So in data SecOps, what you need is you need really good production quality data down in your non-production databases, but it should not be real data. It has to be really good, but it should not be real. So creating realistic development data is one of the basic use cases of the data sec ops. Um, and then once you create these like functionally accurate, uh, performance accurate, uh, clearly well-defined data sets that are just like production data, then you can lower your development costs by shipping them offshore. So that is another reason why creating these data sets quickly so that your developers have access to good quality data is important. Uh, you will also sometimes require small data sets. Your production data could be really large. You might want to create smaller data sets for different groups of people for different purposes. So the ability to create subsets of data is also part of data SecOps. Not only do these data sets go to pure lower environments for um, development, right? Sometimes these data sets are also created for analytics purpose, not necessarily for decision-making systems, but for analytics, for looking at trends, for looking at what, um, how the spend patterns happen across different zip codes um, or healthcare, how do demographics impact the need for certain types of healthcare? All of that, you still need really good data, but you do not need the specific uh, individual's information. So it'll be important for you to know there's a male who's in his forties who lives in downtown Baltimore, but you really don't need to know the person's name or their actual date of birth. So that is where the anonymization also helps with creating these ethically well-defined data that is used for analytics. Um, and then you also need to think about data leakage and as more and more regulations and uh, come, comes in, the need to protect these non-production databases so that the data doesn't get up, that's also important. And what we have noticed is sometimes some simple rudimentary um, anonymization routines, which a lot of companies partake in, creates um, performance-based inaccurate data. Um, uh, let me give you an example. Let us say in your production system, there are a, a million parthasaradis in the table and the index is built off of that. Now I download that uh, into non-production and I change all of those parthasaradis to Joe's and rebuild the indexes. Now, anything that I write, any code, any new report, any new procedure that I write in non-production, the indexes will respond entirely differently 
than when it, when it migrates to production. So in this world of continuous integration, we have to keep the data very realistic, not only functionally, but also from a performance standpoint. The length has to be the same. The indexes have to respond the same because if you start doing continuous integration and sending code that is not properly tested against production-like data, you're going to carry problems in production. So these are some of the reasons why data SecOps is becoming extraordinarily important in today's day and age in faster delivery, but also more accurately secured data for the purpose of data SecOps. Uh, anything to add, Paul? Well, uh, one comment I would make is that uh, with the data virtualization that we're looking at today, the need to subset uh, data sets is really going away. Uh, we can deliver a five terabyte environment as quickly as we can deliver a five gigabyte environment. Uh, so, that, that is very interesting. Uh, that that type of technology that it exists itself is uh, is a miracle. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think that the need for subsetting will be uh, diminishing. That actually sets up the, a question we just got. Mentis already has a module called I subset. Is that replaced with data uh, data SecOps? provisioning a subset of production data? I think you just answered that, Paul. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the important point is that uh, customers have a choice. You know, Mentis and many other companies support uh, subsetting today. You can do subsetting with uh, Windocs as well. Um, uh, but, you know, what we're demonstrating today, this data virtualization, the ability to deliver you know, of complex environment with a dozen databases that totals up five or 10 terabytes of data. You can do that as quickly as delivering a single database of five gigabytes in size. Uh, so with that ability, the need to subset for delivery efficiency uh, really goes away. That's, yeah, and, uh, and disk is also cheaper, much cheaper than it used to be. So subsetting for the purpose of storage savings is, has disappeared. Um, however, I subset as a product still exists. There are still some, some use cases where it can work. Data SecOps is an overall term for what the, where the industry is heading. So it's like DevOps, DevSecOps, Data SecOps. The individual products between Mentis and Windows still exist. We still use those different products to deliver your overall data SecOps. That's, that's what that is. So I subset doesn't go away. The need for I subset has largely diminished over the over the years, but it is still there. The functionality is still there. We can still deliver that. But like Paul said, the need to shrink those databases more or less is gone because the, why would you want to shrink those databases? One would be for storage space and second for the amount of time it takes to deliver those databases. But by using Windows, you can deliver those databases quickly, no matter what the size and disk space is cheaper. So you really are not doing any saving by trying to trim that data, right? It's just unnecessary process to delay things. Um, so well, that's yeah, even even more, uh, Rajesh, the virtualized databases that we deliver in this demo occupy 40 megabytes. So the actual storage use, uh, uh, use will be the same whether or not it's subsetted or a complete set, you know, oh, 40 so megabytes. It's pretty hard to get less than 40 megabytes in consumption. So what is the original data volume? Uh, what is sitting on production um, that becomes 40 megs involved? Correct, correct. So the original data is like one terabyte and you brought it down to 40 megs, is that what? Um, is yeah, that what uh, we, there's obviously a lot that's going on behind the scenes, but yeah, that's the uh, data, data environment on delivery will be 40 megabytes. That's amazing. Yeah. So all of the reasons for subsetting databases have just disappeared. Um, yeah, uh, I believe so, but I'm yeah. sure there are cases where it's useful. Yeah, the functionality still exists, but the need basically is disappearing each passing day with with all the innovation Windows. Right. Is doing. Yep. So go to the next slide, Ervi. Okay, so the solution that uh, Rajesh and I have been talking about comes together in the following uh, view. You can think of any. Uh, data source on the left-hand side, any storage infrastructure on-premise or cloud. It can be Docker containers, it's conventional instances, it's Oracle and SQL Server and all the other relational node uh, SQL uh, and document-based uh, data that is brought into a process where 
Uh, Mantis applies the data discovery and data preparation and uh, masking processes that gets incorporated with the data into a secure uh, versioned image. These images run on Windows servers and Linux servers. There's a unified management control plane and API server. And that becomes your cross-platform data repo. Uh, now, that can be very complex environments. Uh, we've got customers that are serving up data warehouse environments of 20 terabytes or more on demand for uh, a data warehouse DevOps process. As applications are being updated, the organization is serving up these data warehouse environments using this process to uh, test prior to the data update uh, or the application update release. In the so same how, way how operational, this, yeah, go ahead. How, how long will this process take? It, it takes a matter of seconds as we'll see in the demo. It right. can be very, very fast. And the delivered environments on the right-hand side occupy 40 megabytes on delivery. They're typically uh, delivered with a Docker container, but they also can be uh, delivered to conventional uh, application instances as well. And you can see that's orchestrated by really any continuous integration service. Today, we're going to uh, demo Azure DevOps. Could be Circle CI, it could be CodeFresh. Uh, it also can oftentimes be uh, Kubernetes as well. And we'll publish the metadata for master data management and other metadata uh, services within the enterprise. Uh, so this is a, a quick overview of what we're going to look at. And the a common best practice in DevOps today is to use plain text con configuration files to determine your DevOps process. And we utilize this in the form of a Docker file uh, at Windocs. And this is a very simple plain text uh, document that specifies the image. Now, in this case, this Docker file is specifying uh, the use of Microsoft SQL 2017. We're actually uh, sourcing databases in the form of full backups in this case, uh, DB1, 2, and 3. And we are then going to copy and apply a uh, Mantis based uh, data masking in the form of a SQL script. The script is copied into the image and then run uh, during the image build. Uh, so when the build is complete, the databases are restored, the masking is applied and you have a versioned uh, virtualized image. Now, there's also a environment variable, uh, use Docker file to create the container. Anything that falls below that Docker file are runtime steps that are applied to the data environment on delivery. Uh, so in this case, we're adding some logins uh, to facilitate support in dev and test. Other popular runtime events would be cloning a Git repo. Uh, people want to leverage these environments for uh, dev and test. So testing will clone a repo, set the Git branch to a release branch so that they can do testing against a um, you know, production-like database environment, but with the migration scripts for uh, the release branch. Developers will do the same. They'll clone the repo, but they'll set the Git branch to a feature branch uh, so they can continue on with their work. In this way, a shared image can be used with uh, both developers and testers uh, using you know, different branches within a Git repo. Um, so it's very simple to work with these uh, plain text Docker files. Now, as that slide shows, the data is being moved into a Windox image build. The Mentis uh, goodness is being added at that point in time. And then you end up with anonymized cloned uh, database environments being served up on demand for UAT uh, development and test. Um, and with that, let's uh, go ahead and I'm going to share my screen now. Can you enable my screen sharing? Okay, so uh, here we are, we're on a 
Windox server this happens to be running on AWS. Uh, you can see we've got uh, you know cross-platform data repo here with Postgres and Oracle on a Linux server at the IP address uh, shown. And here on the uh, Windows server, I've got a SQL server environment, uh, both with masking and unmasked environments. And if I click over here to the containers and uh, clones, you can see I've got a unmasked uh, SQL server environment along with a couple of other containers for Oracle and uh, Postgres environments. These two are not running on this uh, local Windows server. They're on a separate uh, Linux uh, server at this IP address. This, uh, this Windows machine, by the way, is a two virtual core machine. So you can begin to appreciate that uh, you know, containers can be very economical to operate. Um, what I want to do now is I want to uh, quickly show you that the, this unmasked environment um, is here. It's running in a SQL Server container. We can see that uh, the data includes Todd Lehman and Cameron Marlowe. Uh, we're going to come back to this in a minute. Uh, because what we're going to do now is we're going to kick off a, uh, a two-stage pipeline. And uh, what we're doing is we're uh, managing uh, data in this case as a DevOps artifact. The data environment has been built, it's versioned, and we can serve it up on demand from a CI process like we are here. Um, the CI process is a great way to run environments for pre-release testing. Um, and now this Azure DevOps pipeline is kicked off and it will run through to completion. And this won't be uh, quite as fast as a .NET or Java uh, pipeline, uh, but it runs in a matter of seconds. In this case, it's gonna take uh, between one and two minutes uh, per uh, stage in this two-stage pipeline. So this pipeline is going to spin up a uh, Mentis masked SQL Server environment with a database clone and uh, delivers a with a SQL Server container. Uh, that's going to be done in just over a minute. There's some time then required to run the uh, migration scripts for testing. On passing that first stage environment, it will then proceed automatically to the next stage. This is a very typical approach for automated uh, continuous integration testing. As developers are committing new scripts to this Git repo, the uh, pipeline can be triggered automatically to test those updated scripts with uh, automated testing. And this is really uh, represents where all of my customers are going um, you know, we've been in the business now for five plus years, got customers around the world, and people often begin with uh, this database virtualization and containerization uh, in a self-service model. And uh, as you saw from our web UI, the web UI supports that quite nicely. Uh, but uh, they want to move to a process where things are uh, put into an automated DevOps pipeline. If there's one thing that's true in the marketplace, you can see that over the past uh, five years in particular, DevOps has really grown in popularity. Uh, application and mid-tier uh, development and tests now really almost always is part of some sort of DevOps process. That DevOps process oftentimes now is running within a Kubernetes cluster on a public cloud. And so our customers are moving to this type of approach for the back end um, to make the back end uh, fit into a DevOps process that matches up with the front end DevOps process. Now, the databases oftentimes are on premise. So people are using kind of a hybrid cloud model where uh, the front end Kubernetes based application environment is chugging away. But at the same time, we're provisioning and automating the delivery of the backend environments that are running oftentimes on-premise. It also can run on the cloud and are hooked up 
automatically to that front end for the uh, testing. And just while I've been uh, yammering away, you can see we're approaching the end of a two-stage uh, DevOps process. The first stage passed, uh, and now we're into the uh, second stage, the what would be the integration testing stage on this uh, SQL Server environment. Um, this is uh, you know, where people are going in terms of you know, back end and data related uh, testing processes. Now this environment is uh, built in the uh, Mentis data masking. And so I know that it's secure, it's versioned, it doesn't, uh, it's not modified, it's identical from one to the next to the next. The only thing that's changing is what uh, am I writing to this environment after it's delivered? So the image itself is immutable. Uh, the runtime environment is writable uh, and that's needed for almost all testing processes. Now, when this process is complete, uh, normally if the stages pass these tests, they are automatically deleted because they can be replaced just as quickly this really saves organizations who today oftentimes are having to curate and update and maintain these test data environments. That need goes away with the ability to provision these environments in a matter of seconds. So Paul, does this work on uh, all versions of SQL Server and Oracle and Postgres? Yeah, yeah. Um, SQL Server 2008 to 2019, database engine and all the major services. Likewise for Postgres and Oracle, our Postgres and Oracle Linux support is just uh, just being released. And we're very, very excited about that. It's really a, a much uh, requested capability. And we'll really be the first uh, vendor in the marketplace doing this type of database virtualization on standard Linux and Windows servers. The benefit there is that you know, a DevOps team can download this software and install it, be up and running in a matter of uh, minutes and, uh, you know, uh, pilot this in a matter of days. It's not difficult to uh, get started and really is a, a new level of capability uh, for the marketplace. Now I've, I've come back to my uh, page here. I'm going to refresh. You can see We've got these two new environments running at ports 10,012 and 10,013. Uh, these are environments that are just like the others. So remember, we're looking at Todd Lehman as an unmasked uh, data set. Let's connect to this new environment that was just delivered. Again, this is a identical environment except the uh, database was masked. So if we go to take a look here, you can see it has been masked. So what have we seen here? We've seen that we now have the ability to version data environments, Postgres and Oracle on Linux, SQL Server on Windows, or any other data environments on those platforms. So it's a cross-platform versioned uh, data environment with built-in data security. We have user and group level uh, access controls. I'm, I'm logged in as an administrator and that's why I have the ability to see the unmasked uh, image. If I were logged in as an ordinary user, uh, I wouldn't have access to this unmasked image. Uh, so there's user and group access controls. Uh, we have a full audit log of what's going on on the system, uh, built-in security, and uh, you know, this is a very powerful way to work with data environments in a DevOps-oriented world. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, Paul, you stop mentioned a pilot. My and I think this oh. is probably, um, you mentioned a pilot and probably a question for both uh, you and Rajesh is what's involved in a pilot? Yeah, great question. Um, we provide the software for download 
and we support people for at no cost for a 30 day pilot. Um, sometimes those pilots might run a bit longer when people are taken away from uh, supporting that pilot, but uh, most people will complete the pilot well within 30 days. And uh, so it's a very easily accessed, easily evaluated solution. Um, and since Memphis is sitting inside um, how Windox operates, you see we didn't show any uh, Memphis screens at all. Um, we can fit into that same timeline. Another question, how do you ensure mask.sql logic is encrypted on storage and on the move? The, uh, it's done at the infrastructure level on database level, you know, so yeah. it's, Actually, it's supported the by, the, you know, by the cloud or on the on-premise infrastructure. Uh, and that mask.sql actually doesn't have the routines of uh, what you're masking or anything like that. That is all done inside the database itself. The Mentis mask.sql that uh, Windox was calling was basically just um, telling the system to go, go get Mentis and run it. Um, and then Mentis will then work inside the database itself, discover the columns that have sensitive data and anonymize it all on its own. So there is, even if somebody opens at mask.sql, they will not see anything to do with what data is secure or what proteins, that is all done inside the database system cells. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I think the question related to over the wire encryption, is that right, Keith? Um, yeah, it said on, and, and on the move. Yeah, on the move. So the on the move encryption is gonna be handled by, you know, uh, commonly uh, done in the cloud you know, with various uh, uh, over the wire encryption protocols. So on AWS, that's very common. Are there any other questions from the, uh, from the uh, attendees? Okay, uh, we should continue with the slides. I think that was it. I think we've come to the end of it. I think this was a very, very good presentation, Paul. Very impressive as always. Every time I see Windox presentations and demonstrations, I'm surprised at how um, simple it is and what value it delivers. Uh, I think we have some attendees today who, are, who have been interested in Mentis, um, but now are interested in Windox as well because it not only solves the security problem, it also solves the delivery problem in a quite an elegant way. Um, there is another question. Yeah. Uh, all of the, old, all all of the, overhead, all of the overhead from the backup file, correct? I'm, uh, I didn't hear that. What was the question? All of the overhead to build the Docker will come from the backup file, correct? Yeah, the, uh, uh, when you use backups, and this solution doesn't require backups, but it's a very common one, particularly for SQL Server, uh, the time to build the image is uh, the, going to be the same as restoring a backup. The important thing is that the image build can be a one-time event. So you build the image with the full backups and then we can update the images with differential or transactional log backups going forward. Um, so yes, the uh, question is a good one. Uh, backups do continue to be a resource intensive process uh, with this process, it can be a one-time event. And once built, then the image supports delivery of environments on demand. Well, very good. Well, these have been some good questions. I've uh, enjoyed this session. There, there is another, uh, another question. Uh, go ahead, Keith. Can Windocs be used as a data virtualization tool? Has it been recognized by Gartner or Forrester? It is a data virtualization tool. And uh, at this point, I believe that we're the market share leader. We've been at this for five years. And uh, we're just uh, beginning our relationships with Gartner and Forrester, although Gartner recognized us as a cool vendor in cloud infrastructure in 2018. Uh, Bloor Research just published a article that put, puts us in leadership position in the test data management space in data virtualization. So Blur Research recognizes us in that fashion. I think that Gartner and uh, Forrester both will soon. 
Great, thank you. All right, no more open, no more questions. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Rajesh. Um, and um, have a good rest of your day, everyone. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, guys. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye.